Hello, I am Eric Sarkar, and I'm in the group that uh, we're doing SKS spherical roller bearing catalog selection procedures. Now, SKF stands for Stenka Cooler Fabricant, which is uh, the largest supplier of roller bearings. It's in 130 countries. It has 100 factories in 70 countries, 15,000 distributors, and 40,000 employees. Now, the history of roller bearings uh, started probably in Egypt, uh, where they they think that they used it to build the, the pyramids. Now, it was crucial to the use of roller bearings for architecture since it transferred the sliding contact of a main load to a less frictional rolling contact. Now, the first roller bearings that uh, were found were in uh, 40 BC, uh, Romans used it in turntables. And then in the 15th century, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, had a design which we see here and used it on a helicopter design. In the 16th century, Galileo described the first cage ball bearings design, and which decreased friction and it kept the rolling elements from contact with each other. Now, in 1794, Philip Boggin uh, patented the first ball bearing, and he patented it to be used in the wheels of a, of a bicycle. The bicycles were uh, manufactured by Friedrich Fischer in 1870. And now, the problem with these is that they were man-made. Each bearing was made by hand. So they weren't very reliable. The life, the lifespan of each bearing would, would be cut short by the friction caused by the uneven uh, sizes of the balls. Now, in 1907, Sven Vinquist uh, patents the multi of aligning radio ball bearings and found SKF. Uh, that's him uh, designing, and this is his actual design. And by 1920, SKF was already in four continents. Now, worldwide distribution makes uh, standards necessary. As more and more companies started springing up, most of the times they were made specifically and customized for a certain machine. Now, by 1933, the Anti-Friction Bearing Manufacturer Association, or AFEMA, uh, started to try to standardize sizes so that companies would be able to build faster and, and quicker. Yeah. And then that became the American Bearing Manufacturers Association in 1993. Now, Fisher, Atkin, Jesselich have uh, allow, uh, allows reliability to become a more significant factor. By make, they discover a, a way to make the bearings by machine so that they're all the same or close to being the same. And it makes manufacturing much easier, quicker. And now the, the initial selection was really more about load and size. But this allowed uh, reliability to be a, a considerable factor when selecting uh, ball bearings. And uh, as speed as, speed as a consideration also came into part as lubrication techniques were developed. Hello, my name is Kelsey Vasquez, and uh, right now I'm going to speak about the current designs of ball bearings. The four basic designs that we have of ball bearings are spherical, cylindrical, tapered, and needle. Uh, so the first type of bearing that we have is the most common one. Uh, it's the cheapest. Uh, the cheapest design is called the open bearing. Uh, as you can see, you can actually see the bearings are exposed to the element. It allows it to run cooler, easier to lubricate, but it also is easier for material to fall in and degrade the ball. In addition, as it is just a perfectly round bearing, you have to create some sort of retainer to hold it in place. The next one is called the flange bearing. Same concept where the bearings are exposed to the elements. Again, it's still run cooler, easier to, uh, to lubricate, but uh, the small taper design that it has allows it to slip straight into holes, uh, thus removing the, the necessity of a bracket or some sort of mounting mechanism. Uh, the next one is the double shielded bearing, similar to the open bearing, but instead of the element, instead of the bearing actually being exposed, there's a small metal plate that protects both sides. Now uh, this gives a more robust design. It doesn't allow material to fall into it. But the, but the one drawback is lubricant can't be replaced, and uh, the speed is dropped drastically due to the actual shielding. 
Another big concern is that uh, if the bearing is exceeded in temperature or in speed, the lubricant inside will start to burn up, and that could actually drastically de uh, degrade the life because the burned lubricant is now inside. Uh, the next one is a double sealed bearing, similar to the, uh, to the shielded bearing, but instead of metal, it's uses plastic. Uh, the advantage of plastic is that it's actually quieter. Uh, the speed is, is reduced even more than what the metal one, what the metal bearing would be used, but uh, this one will reduce noise. And our final design isn't specifically a roller bearing for uh, horizontal use. This is more used for in vertical uses where this bearing will sit on the bottom of the base and the bearing and the axle has a flange and that rests on top of the, of the bearing. Uh, as you can tell, these are very thin and the, they're designed for large impacts, large vertical impacts. The cons is that they can be very fragile and in due to their design, the debris can easily slide in from the sides. Uh, the three biggest steps are choosing the style and design of the bearing, finding what your limitations are, and from there on finding what the standards are, the standard sizes that are readily available. Uh, the most common limitations are the outer diameter, inner diameter, and the width. Also we have the flange that sizes, which would be the outer diameter, the thickness, how much load, the speed, and the price. So for our two examples, the first one we're going to be using is a bicycle wheel, as it was one of the first ideas. Uh, one of the first bearings that were designed. So for bicycle wheels, the design is a flange design, as you can see here, and this fit, this side will fit into a hub, which would be the Y bracket of the bicycle, and it has a bolt that passes through that locks it in place. So the, the limitations that we have are the inner diameter, which is from 10 millimeters to 20 millimeters, because that's the standard size for all uh, bicycle shafts. Uh, in addition to that, we have the flange outer diameter, which we said, which we limited to the outer diameter plus one eighth of an inch, just to leave it as small as possible, and so that we don't run into the spokes. Uh, the next thing we have is the flange thickness. Again, we want it as thin as possible, as to not allow, uh, as to not take up too much space horizontally. And the dynamic load, we put 100 pounds. There are four of these bearings, two on each side of every wheel, so 400 pounds total. That's equivalent to an average size man taking a hard impact. Uh, and finally, the last thing we have is 50 RPMs. 50 RPMs is approximately 40 kilometers per hour, 45 kilometers per hour. So this, uh, those are our limitations. Uh, we use these values and put it into the MacMaster bearing search engine. And first thing we put is a 3 inch diameter shaft. Uh, once that was put in, we already had a limiting range of weight, speed, and once we had those three, we really couldn't narrow it down more. So all we really had left to do was choose the flange thickness, the outer diameter uh, of the bearing, the flange diameter, and the width. Uh, using these, uh, we were able to get a, a flange diameter of one sixth of an inch, and we have four products or six different selections left over. Outer diameter, we have two choices. Width, we have two choices. And flange outer diameter, we have two choices. Our second example is a bandsaw wheel. Uh, the difference between this type of bearing and the one used in the bicycle is that this bearing actually fits inside of the wheel and is bolted on from both sides. So the biggest concern that we're going to have on this design is the material to be flowing through the wheel, or around the wheel, due to the fact that you are cutting up wood or metal or rubber or any type of shavings will be moving around there. So a seal design would be our our ideal choice. We can choose metal or rubber, but we would prefer metal for this type due to the, uh, the, the, the more industrial application. Our outer diameter, inner diameter, and width are all open choices. We don't really have any specific choice. But one thing we do know is that the dynamic load is 250 pounds. This is the weight of the blade under tension. And also, the max RPM that we need is 3,500 RPMs. Uh, when putting these two speed, the speed and load, into MacMaster, we were able to get that the smallest outer diameter that we can have is a 2932. Uh, we can choose a larger size, and the smallest width we can have is a 516. Um, obviously, the, the, the width of the bearing would be ideal if it was the same width as the wheel, so that could be calibrated for that. In addition, the inner diameter, we have three possible choices left. 5 16, 3 8 and 7 16. 
You know that at any of these three sizes, we will be able to hold between 250 to 500 pounds, and that we will reach the desired speed. It's a conceptual design. Uh, we did a, a wind quest bearing. Uh, the special part about this bearing is that it has two rows of doll bearings, uh, and the objective is for it to, first, it can support more weight, and also it centers itself uh, it auto centers itself when it's spinning. Uh, the one that we designed here has a one and a half inch inner diameter, two inch outer diameter, half inch thick, and has 90 ball bearings in each row, so a total of 180. And the way that it, it actually works is that there's a small curvature in the inside of the bearing, and when the balls are running straight, they, can, they run on the flat section when everything is, is lined up. When it gets out of alignment, the ball will run onto the curved surface and cause a normal force to push it back in. Uh, this design is normally in very special application. Hello, my name is Ben Young, and I will be talking about the feature design. So, as my previous colleagues have mentioned, uh, there's different uh, applications for the, uh, the spherical uh, bearings. Here are some designs done on simulation software. So currently, there's many. Uh, the selection process is very basic. It's very straightforward. You can use uh, reference handbooks. There's catalogs, and now there's even online searches. Uh, we use uh, McMaster, and SKF also offers uh, online search. You just have to input different uh, different uh, parameters, and then it just searches during in their catalog for the specific design. Also there's, uh, you can also get customized parts if necessary. So in the future, the possible application for the selection process, it could advance to, a possible uh, advancement could be to actually make the bearing onto the, onto the model on using SolidWorks, AutoCAD, ANSYS, any type of preferable uh, simulation software. And you can actually test out uh, if it will up, it will it will handle the load. If it will fail at certain cycles, it does all the calculations, and it does uh, this will help uh, minimize time, and in turn, it minimizes costs. So, back to the limiting factors. It's important. It's very important to address those because. You, you, as a consumer or an industry, you're looking into buying spherical bearings. You have to know what, what, what purpose will it serve, what function it is. Because if you don't address that early on, uh, it could be very catastrophic. Uh, there will be failure, there, it could not fit. And here is a chart provided by SKF on their website. And here I highlighted spherical roller bearings and it shows where it's very uh, excellent uh, characteristics and here to name a few are the radial loading it's very good it's excellent and the stiffness and the, the moment load and uh, yeah. so uh, on here on the left is a uh, is a current uh, state of the selection process for SKF from the bearings. This is take a screenshot stick taken straight from uh, SKS website, which uses the online search engine. And here, there's different parameters you can input. As I'll list off some, you can get cylindrical tapered, as uh, Kyle Tien had mentioned before. You can also get the seals, or you can kind of have it open. And here, once you do the search and find the specific model that fits your needs. You, it, the system actually shows you a drawing of it. It does a few calculations in here and uh, the limiting factors as well. So the selection process has gone, has advanced uh, from where you could just uh, pick out from the manual and use having to search each individual thing. And now you can just input numbers and it just finds it right there. It's very convenient and it saves a lot of time which is very important in industry because time is everything.